If you're a high income earner, then it's safe to say that taxes are your biggest expense. Now, as a periodontist, I'm constantly on the lookout for ways to lower taxes, and real estate investing is one of the best ways to do it. Now, you may have heard that becoming a real estate professional is a way to lower your taxes, but for many of us working full time, this simply isn't possible. If you want another option, then in this video, we're going to discuss a strategy called the short term rental tax loophole, which isn't really a loophole, but a tremendous opportunity to save big time on your taxes. But before we get into that, a quick disclaimer. I'm not a CPA, attorney, or financial advisor. It's always to best to consult with your own team of professionals about the topics that we cover in today's video. And if you're serious about lowering your taxes while building passive income along the way, download the free passive income guide below this video. Let's begin. So let's start off by defining what exactly is a short-term rental. Now, a property is considered to be a short-term rental if it's actually rented out less than seven days at a time on average. Now, as you can imagine, these types of properties are very popular in tourist destinations. Plus, with the advent of platforms like Airbnb, HomeAway, things like that, it's never been easier for virtually anybody with a vacation home to use it as a short-term rental. The older I get, the smarter, not harder, I want to work. Now, you may feel the same way as well. Now, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, one way to work smarter is by qualifying as a real estate professional. And this is also whenever you file your taxes, it's called real estate professional status. To qualify, the IRS states that you must meet a, uh, a few conditions. The first one being this, you must spend the majority of your time, you must spend more than 50% in real property businesses in which you material participate. And then number two, you must spend 750 hours or more in the real property business and rentals in which you material participate, which comes out to be a more roughly like 15 hours a week. So in other words, you've got to work on real estate more than you do on your day job. Because the time requirements make it very difficult to qualify working full time, many high income professionals are turning to a different option, voila, the short term rental and the short term rental tax loophole. Now, what is what what exactly is this loophole? Well, this was found in the tax code under Section 469, and it defines ex exceptions to the definition of what's termed rental activity. Now, there's actually six ways, six ways in which income for rental property can be excluded from the definition of a rental activity and thus not automatically passive. So the first one is the average period of customer use for a property again, is seven days or less. Number two, the average period of customer use for such property is 30 days or less and significant personal services are provided by or on behalf of the owner of the property, which would be you in connection with making the property available for use by the customer or by the renter. So this could, you know, this could include services such as something like a hotel would provide, such as daily cleaning or meals. Okay. The third is Extraordinary personal services are provided by or on behalf of the owner of the property in connection with making such property available for renters without regard to the average period of customer use. Fourth, the rental of such property is treated as incidental to a non-rental activity of the taxpayer. Fifth, the taxpayer customarily makes the property available during defined business hours for non-exclusive use by various customers. And last but not least, the provision of the property for use in an activity conducted by a partnership, S Corp or joint venture in which the taxpayer owns an interest is not considered a rental activity. So those are the six ways that the IRS states in which income from a rental property. So if you own a beach home, so those are the six ways in which income from a rental property can not be counted as rental activity. So basically it's, not tax. All right. So what does all this mean? So what are, what are some of the steps that we can take knowing all this stuff in order to shelter our income? So let's break this down into layman's terms for you. Number one, buy a short term rental. Number two, you'll need to materially participate in that rental. Number three, obtain a cost segregation study. Number four, using the depreciation that you're going to get so you're going to hire an engineering firm to come in 
and perform this study, uh, study cost segregation. They're going to segregate out the cost. So instead of being able to depreciate the property over 20 to 27 and a half years for rental property. So if it's a million dollar property, uh, you could depreciate uh, 27.5 years. So $27,500 you could take in depreciation in a million dollar property over the 27.5 years, or you get a cost segregation study that will speed it up and you can use accelerated depreciation. A, a lot of it you can use in the first few years. Okay. So you're, you're using the majority of it instead of waiting 27 and a half years, you're speeding it up and getting all that depreciation up front to start to shelter your income. You lower your income, thus you lower your taxes. Number five, after you uh, use an accelerated uh, depreciation, you can actually cl claim paper losses on your business, on your business, your doctor, your physician, your dentist, you're an attorney. This is used to offset income, your active income. This is why this is very important. And last but not least, you want to make sure that you hire a, a well-qualified real estate CPA who actually understands how to use these tax deductions from your short-term rental. And again, applying it to your active income. How huge is that? So let's talk a little bit about material participation tests. So we talked about uh, that a little bit for this loophole. So it may be difficult if you're a physician or a dentist or other professional, again, to become a real estate professional because it's really hard to spend half if you're full time to spend half of your dentist, half of your working hours in a real estate business. Again, this is why this short term rental tax loophole is so important, how it can help. But remember that you must materially participate in your short term rental to ensure that you can apply the tax deductions against your active income, if it's practice income or whatever. Well, you may say, well, how do I do this? Well, there's actually IRS states there's seven ways to accomplish this, but guess what? you only need to fulfill one of the seven to show that you have material participation for the tax year in your rental that you own. So let's, let's briefly go over the seven material participation tests. The first one is you actually participated, you participated for more than 500 hours in your short-term rental business. Again, you only have, you only have to meet one of the seven. All right. Second one, your activity constituted all participation substantially. So substantial participation for the uh, STR business. Three, your participation was more than a hundred hours and no less than the participation of, of any other individual. So you have to, you have to work more than a hundred hours and it has to be that hundred hours or whatever it is, has to be more than anybody else working in your business. All right. The fourth one is, you must, you must have a significant participation activity for more than a hundred hours again, and your combined activity in all significant participation activities is actually more than 500 hours. Fifth, you materially participated in an activity for five of the last 10 years, six personal service activity, which would be any type of non-income producing activity, uh, for the previous three uh, taxable years. And last but not least, you participated for more than a hundred hours in a regular, continuous and substantial basis during the year. Remember, once you meet one of these seven tests and then your short, your short term rental is excluded. It excludes it from the definition of being a rental activity, being rental income. Thus it's considered non-passive. Remember, the goal is to use the goal is to use your short term rental for non passive losses. These losses can be used to offset your non passive income, your active income. Now, here's the thing. Whenever people get into uh, a syndication, they automatically think, OK, I'm going to uh, put money in hundred thousand dollars to a syndication. I can use that depreciation from the cost segregation cost segregation study. I can use the accelerated depreciation to offset my income, right? Wrong. Because the, the syndication that's considered a passive loss. When they get, when they get this depreciation, you're a passive investor. You're a limited partner. You're not a general partner. So you can take that depreciation and use it to offset your passive income. 
from the apartment building or self storage building or whatever. Okay. So passive, you can use those passive losses that you're going to get in a syndication to offset the passive income that you're going to get. So for instance, if you've got a million dollars in syndication deals, funds or deals or whatever, and let's say total in total, you're getting an average of 7% a year. Well, that's 7% of a million dollars. That's $70,000 a year. And you can take depreciation and use it to offset that passive income. Thus, that's basically tax, you know, depending on what your tax strategy is, it's tax free or tax deferred. But think about it. If you had a million dollars in mutual funds and you take $70,000 or 7% off, you're going to pay capital gains tax. Plus what's happening to the million dollars. Well, not only is it drawing down, but depending on what the stock market's up or down and, and lately it's been pretty far down, that million dollars is going down over time. Thus, you always have to worry about in your account running out of money with the syndication strategy. It is going to typically appreciate over the, uh, the term that you hold it. But again, you can use that the uh, passive losses to offset the passive income with what we're talking about here. You're able to get these are uh, non passive losses which can offset your non-passive income, thus your W-2 income. Thus, if you, again, if you're a physician or dentist, you can use it to offset your active income. I'm gonna give you an example here, right? Uh, in just a minute, if you hold on just a little bit to the end of the video. Now, again, if you're able to pass one of these seven material participation tests, you're now ready to begin generating losses from your short-term rental with, again, using this cost segregation study that we talked about. Now, the, the goal of the study is to identify all the construction related costs that can be depreciated. And instead of, again, if it's 39 years, it's 39 years for a commercial property, it's 27.5 years for residential, but it, it actually lets you speed this up and breaks it down. It, it, it segregates out the cost into five, seven and 15 year tax lives. So for instance, you know, you, you know, the IRS knows that the, the carpets and the floors, they're going to, they're going to wear out quicker than they are in 27 and a half years. So they allow you to upfront in five years depreciate all that you have in there versus going out for 27 and a half years. So this study segregates out the cost in your property. This is such a powerful strategy. And again, five and 15 year property generally represent anywhere from 20 to 30% of a property's purchase price up front, you can get that depreciation. Okay. So let's, let's close this out by using a very simple yet powerful example. Okay. So you have Dr. STR and Dr. STR is uh, an oral surgeon. He's been practicing for about four to five years and he's making good money. You know, he's making 300 a year, uh, but he is tired already of paying all the tax because all the wisdom teeth is, driving up his income, but all the tax. So he's like, well, what can I do? So he goes out and he actually purchases. He loves going to Destin. He likes the 30A area. So he goes to that area, buys a $1.2 million beach house. Okay. Now his real estate savvy CPA informed him that he could actually utilize bonus depreciation to shelter. He could use the bonus depreciation to shelter around 250,000 to $300,000 of his oral surgery income. Cause again, he went out, he got a cost segregation study on the property. They were able to, to do that, use the bonus depreciation up front, And they determined, and again, he's using a really good CPA. That's the key. He was able to determine they were able to uh, shelter that much of his income. So again, because Dr. STR, he makes $300,000 a year. That's his W-2 income. If he's able to do this, if he, again, if he uses a, a CPA that knows what they're doing, then he may be able to pay little to no taxes at all that first year. How powerful is that? So think about, think about what it would, what, what that could do. If you started implementing strategies like this, not only with syndications, but also occasionally this type of strategy as well. Again, my whole goal for you is to educate you so that you're going, that you can work smarter, not harder. All right. 
So let's wrap this up. So again, utilizing this tax loophole is a very effective way for you, the high income earner, to reduce your overall tax burden. Again, make sure that you get help from a real estate CPA or attorney or both to guide you through the process because that's gonna be one of the keys to making this strategy a success. Now, if you wanna learn more about, I know I kinda of briefed over the cost segregation and the acceleration, accelerated depreciation, but if you wanna learn more in detail about how you can use accelerated appreciation to lower your overall taxes, then I want you to go to this video over here and I'll break it down for you. I'll see you in this video.